The longer you can look back, the farther you can look forward. Hello, welcome uh, to our uh, journey through history of diplomacy and technology. It's a really great honor and pleasure to have you today here. It's going to be an interesting journey. I'm very, very passionate uh, about this issue. And those of you who know um, me know that I have been always trying to anchor what we are doing now into historical context with necessary care. Therefore, the, this is the first session, which is our first step on this uh, interesting, uh, interesting journey. And uh, it has more or less three major guidelines uh, that we will, uh, will follow. Uh, first, we would like to see how the current dilemmas of our time relate to the history. Can we borrow something from history? Can we learn something from, uh, from uh, previous, previous developments? Second, we will try to see also how artificial intelligence can be used to help us dig the wisdom from the, from the history. You saw uh, Winston Churchill and uh, narrating the, his uh, statement on the relevance of our past for our future. That was a fake or animated video done by artificial intelligence team of Diplo. Throughout our events, we will create dialogues with historical figures. Next month, we will have a dialogue with Hammurabi. We will ask Hammurabi what he can advise us about our current, uh, current moment. Then we will move uh, with historical figures up to, the, um, up to the, I guess, Kissinger. He is alive. Maybe we'll get him to the, to the session. But the idea is also to see what are those transversal issues in the history of uh, technology and diplomacy that we can follow and that can help us to understand the current uh, dynamics. Now, let me just uh, guide you through a few, as you know, uh, Diplo has always an interesting PowerPoints, and let me just guide you through a few key points uh, on this, this journey. Now, this journey, and this is extremely important, is a journey which uh, I hope we will walk together. And uh, from this session onwards, our idea is essentially to focus on the, on the common wisdom and common understanding or shared understanding about this important interplay in the history of uh, diplomacy and technology. For those of you who follow our, uh, my webinars, you know that I'm passionate about this uh, uh, image, image uh, that shows us that we should look for counterfactual or counterintuitive uh, developments. And uh, that part of wandering or wandering birds, those of you who know me, you know that I have always problem with the few, Eng quite a few English words, that, but you will tolerate me, especially my friends John Hamery and those English-speaking uh, uh, colleagues. As I mentioned, uh, we will uh, make a few uh, caveats in our journey. Communication and communication technology is just one of the catalysts of changes. There are other social economic uh, developments. Second point is that uh, we have to be very careful in using historical analogies. Analogies are useful, they can draw our attention to some developments, but they can be also misguiding, they can uh, guide us or to sleepwalk into intellectual laziness and the simple explanation. Therefore, throughout discussion, we will be answering and trying to see complexity of the atmosphere. What's happened in Vienna during the Vienna Congress? What about parties? What wines were used? What perfumes, early appearance of perfumes happened happen that? Therefore, that life element is extremely important. 
We will also consider history happening in parallel. We are taught in sequential history, but uh, developments, especially in technology, have been happening in parallel. It was only two days, two decades ago, when the last telegraph communication was stopped. Those of you of my generation can recall fax. Fax was re reused uh, till, uh, till recently. In language, in diplomatic language, we still use the term cable. Although cables were used to send uh, diplomatic notes and the reports almost, uh, well, 60 or 70 years ago. Therefore, there is that interesting interplay between our understanding language and more or less parallel uh, histories happening in parallel. Now, what is extremely important to understand is that our, on this journey, that our biological and our anthropological elements have been more or less the same since the time of Neanderthals and our far, far predecessor who, according to the latest research, jumped from the tree somewhere in Serengeti in uh, Tanzania and was running away from the lions and, and the, these big animals. He or she, in this case he, but it could be uh, Lucy, famous Lucy or she, uh, had more or less the same cognitive capabilities as we have today. Well, limit by time, 24 hours a day time. But what is more important, capable of holding eight pieces of information in working memory. And here I will uh, uh, bring the Daniel Kahneman and his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. We usually think very fast with our working memory information that we can process. In that working memory, we create new things, we innovate, we connect the dots, we look out of the context, or we run away from the lion or whoever is, uh, is around. That has not changed. The super intelligent people may hold more pieces of information, up to 15, but on average, we can hold eight pieces of information. And you can do the test yourself. Uh, by remembering numbers or, or words. The second element, which is also anthropological and biological constraint that we have, is the number of social contract, uh, contacts that we can maintain. It's a so-called Dunbar number, it's 148. Therefore, we can, uh, when I, we can maintain substantive social contracts with 148 other people. What does it mean? That we have that person in mind, that we can send occasionally message that, uh, as Asoki and I discuss, I remember our discussion on the UN and digital, and I was thinking I should send him a few messages, few messages to Kishan, to Stefano, to John Hamery. Therefore, that space that we have is according to Dunbar, 148. Why are these information are important? That this is a cross-cutting biological and anthropological element throughout the history, throughout definitely written history, but I would say even going further down in the history. Therefore, while we are discussing layers in our civilization, build around technology, science, uh, uh, philosophy, our abstraction, our arts, we should be aware of uh, these limits. And they're very practical. When somebody tells you that he or she has thousands of friends on the Facebook, we should ask and remember this Dunbar number. What does it mean to have a friend on the Facebook? This is the first notion, common sense approach to what are the limits, biological and the cognitive limits that we face when we enter with this narrative, enormous narrative about the, about the future of technology, which is usually built around the, how many tweets you, you receive, you know, those PR exercises. This is the first, I would say, important guidelines that we'll follow throughout our discussion. The second point, and this image was a bit uh, cut, is that we are currently negotiating digital social contract. This digital social contract is not going to be signed on the dotted line. 
it is our understanding what we can we expect from technology for the current moment for the future on the top you can see just the name of confucius lao tzu kautila ibn khaldun machiavelli voltaire aristotle spinoza and other thinkers those people were considering impact on technology on the, their societies at their time how to preserve social dynamics how to preserve family community dynamics how to run a society with some level of ethics and they had different technologies writing we forget that is a technology itself it was invented and we started using it with sumerians i think 3000 plus years ago therefore what we are currently doing we are negotiating our digital social contract digital social contract is understanding for each society what we expect from technology and what technology will do for us each society per se china india uk france europe united states but also what does it mean for international community what does it mean for the global cooperation and global governance now in this negotiation of the social contract one important aspect will be to bring thinking which is outside the dominant uh, intellectual uh, context and circles and we will insist on that we can consult hegel we can con consult hobbes locke grotius but people outside outside the written civilizations uh, uh, in particular china and india and latin america which are written civilizations but we don't know yet enough thanks to the kishan's writing we got a bit on kautilya uh, inputs to on, on on diplomacy but we we know very very little therefore that input is important and another input which will stress is input from from uh, verbal civilization oral civilization which didn't codify their wisdom in writings in particular african civilization and cultures some concepts like ubuntu concept in africa is very applicable to our time therefore through this journey in order to advise our time and our era we will consult this rich rich uh, legacy that we have in positive sense written codified but also unwritten and uncodified this is one of the major elements on this this journey by the way just one important caveat make a comments make a notes questions in chat and later on after this introductory statement we will introduce uh, we'll open the floor for discussion and comments because this journey has to be walked together and to quote African uh, wisdom, if you want to move fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go with others. What is important for digital or any other technology where we will frame our discussion, in particular, the more we are moving to our era, digital impacts environment in which we operate, social, cultural, economic, like any other technology, like telegraph, like telephone, like satellites just a few decades ago it was important to have a knowledge of what's going on in detroit where the car industry is was important nowadays if you want investment or to understand what's going on you have to have people in in the bay area or shenzhen area or bangalore in india there are new centers of political social and economic dynamism new elites and this change is particularly in environment is important second every new technology especially over the last let's say 200 years where the history accelerated brought uh, new topics on diplomatic agenda whether it is uh, telegraphy the itu or labor rights and if you think if you unpack the history of international organizations you will always see important role of technology a red cross was established to the large extent due to the enormous human causalities uh, 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 due to the killing machines advancement in the killing technology 
you have a labor uh, with the with the international labor organization and that element of technology is behind quite a few organizations and then we have a new tools new tools from the fire signals to pigeon to amarna talamarna letters as a first diplomatic archive which was kept in the ancient egypt more recently in the renaissance italy to the to the archives and more more recently uh, telegraph telephone and other developments therefore this will be our methodological framework in which we will be trying to see what are the bridges between technology and diplomacy two key bridges are communication and information behind most of diplomatic activities you have communication engagement representation discussion negotiation and you have information and those are also two key pillars of technology in our journey we will focus also on the thinking history on the way how all of this civilization related to the challenges that they face karl jaspers a german philosopher coined the term axial period and he argued that between 5th uh, uh, century bc and uh, and the uh, new era the after after christ we had more or less all major thinking developments in the which are active till our day to day obviously in the ancient greece with the greek philosophers in china with uh, with confucius and other thinkers in india in uh, well arrival of jesus christ and uh, all of these developments and he argued that more or less centrality of human as a key actor in the societal uh, affairs and aware of his predicaments and his uh, position in society was shaped in this axial period i would extend it a bit more towards the uh, islam and uh, developments uh, in the 7th century and more or less we got the apparatus of that uh, what we see today with another important developments which was enlightenment position when the things were were organized uh, much much better here are the few thinkers from the from uh, china here are few things uh, rousseau voltaire from european context and five thinkers from vienna who basically shaped our era they lived between two world wars in vienna and if you unpack current global economic system you will come very often to them von mise who spent some time in geneva who was ultra liberal economist schumpeter creative destruction you just remove the year and you can see what silicon valley is doing it's 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 him von hayek centrality of knowledge Sigmund Freud psychology and behavioral science and business model of social media and for me the most interesting Wittgenstein the guy who predicted developments of artificial intelligence by moving from his early days at the Cambridge when he was student of Bertrand Russell great thinker of the last century and he gave up on the idea that we can map human existence through mathematical logic and we can do what we can do maximally is to have a probability and probability and the statistics is to the large extent behind the current artificial intelligence which is developing very fast those are this is a qu just quick quick uh, journey now on this journey uh, we'll be bringing intellectual history diplomatic context in which things have developed and in particular thinking outside outside european context and i can see that uh, kishan is raising uh, his uh, hand for a question kishan please go ahead you are over, no, i over. i really over. don't want to interrupt the flow of your um, presentation i would rather wait until you finish thank you very much Kishan, I'm more or less, more or less, uh, more or less finished. But let me just add a few few points uh, which may help us in uh, in, uh, in 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 discussing uh, discussing the key key points uh, of the on this uh, this journey. 
one important is this uh, this uh, map that uh, you can see behind me but we have also to look for counterfactual elements we are not aware that for example today we have less knowledge input from africa than we have in pre-internet era we have only five percent of contributions on wikipedia about africa done by contributors from africa netherlands has more contributors to wikipedia than the whole continent of africa some figures are really uh, striking gdp uh, market capitalization of apple at the 31st of december last year was higher with than complete gdp of african continent those are current moments but what we will plan to do is to anchor them in this historical journey and to see if we can do something if we can make reflections what are the points which are beyond this rather naive view where you have discussing thousand tweets or thousand uh, thousand developments what we're going to do in the process will the bring the historical images historical photos we'll have this simulated discussion with historical figures like we had the quote from a uh, from a uh, churchill but we'll have a debates with metternich with rousseau with indian thinkers with chinese thinkers and that debate will be something which we hope will bring more awareness what's going on and why we need to rely rely on history and historical thinking as we we move on uh, through this process now we'll in the conclusion to our discussion we will also raise the issues related to uh, practicalities how we are going to move on but i don't in the to walk the talk i will really open the floor for uh, for comments and discussion because we have in audience really um, um, such a concentration of uh, brilliant brilliant minds people with a lot of experience with the passion for history with passion for uh, for uh, this uh, out of box thinking when it comes to the our current era kishan over to you it's time for kishan uh, yes uh, thank you very much jovan you have uh, laid out a vast ambitious agenda ambition is a wonderful thing i'm all in favor uh, you are really trying to capture uh, a slice of the past and make it relevant to the present i applaud this but i must also tell you in all truth that i also have problems with it and my primary problem is that people of the west europeans in particular uh, see the world hugely in europe or west centric modes um, civilizations of the past on different continents and we know so little for example of the latin american original civilizations the incas and the many many uh, empires entities that existed which have really left only some fragments of their traces but we know that they were also great thinkers they were they contributed they they perceived the world in a different way and we know so little about this the chinese are very lucky very fortunate that they invented paper long back and that has left china with an incredible record historical written record that is accessible today there are chinese written documents going back to a thousand years and more which are still available we don't have that in india we didn't invent paper so we have only a few copper etchings and stone etchings uh, which have survived but not so much of that but we had a great tradition of oral history and that oral history tradition was destroyed pretty deliberately during the colonial era now i am not here to 
refight uh, old colonial battles and i wouldn't want to discomfort my friend john hemery or anybody else who are shall we say uh, the inheritors of that rather dubious past uh, but be as it may the reality i mean i'm sure that some of your listeners will be a little bit amazed that the english school of liberals were at the forefront of deliberately destroying the heritage of india and supplanting it with a new colonial era memory these are facts what happened in africa is infinitely worse um there were colonial powers portugal france the dutch who actively from the beginning set out to destroy the memory the the heritage of the countries that they occupied the regions the parts of the world the chunks of continents that they occupied um this again is part of dare we say a very dubious western heritage let's acknowledge this i give you a different example the arab world produced great thinkers there was ibn khaldun uh, who was who lived in the region that we today call tunisia ibn khaldun is recognized as probably the world's first major sociologist in terms of the fresh ideas that he delivered uh, but we don't remember them my second big point is that in the past there were flows of people materials and ideas whose magnitude we hardly begin to imagine today for example and you very rightly you mentioned the amarna archives these are the clay tablets of the upper egyptian um, kingdoms and they leave us with a an incredibly rich record of the ways in which the kingdoms of that age dealt with each other traded with each other concluded treaties and alliances and it's all the the infinite complexity of managing inter kingdom interstate that we call it relations totally relevant to our times and we are very fortunate that the amarna clay tablets have survived but think of the persians here is a country uh, uh a civilization that was one of the pioneers in thinking in terms not just of conquest and and the persian uh, kingdom uh, was reigned far and wide they came all the way up to the middle of europe with their armies and with their empire and they their ideas interacted continually with the ideas of the chinese the indians and this is pre islam i'm talking of the second third fifth century bc maybe even earlier but in the times of alexander alexander the great alexander of macedonia uh, there was a vast amount of interchange uh, between persia and the rest of the world of eurasia if we can call it that uh, but nobody remembers them very few uh, even yeah, mention we but we are let me, I, I, I sorry i i think gone on for too long i will conclude with just two quick points the reason why i mention these interchanges of ideas is that in this ambitious journey on which you wish to embark please remember those connections that were woven in the past uh, i am not a historian truth thank you me. I I, I all right uh, all right I will end uh, if you wish make, me to end I I end now thank you very much make reassure that uh, and we know each other for almost two decades when you came for the event of uh, on the on, in mouth on the lateral thinking in 1990 to be precise 
1998 or nine. Uh, I can uh, one of the one uh, of my and things are personal. We have uh, the we today we in the society we everything is depersonalized. But I grew up in a European country, but non-aligned country, and I learned very f early in my life. It was former Yugoslavia, for those who do not know. Uh, I learned, uh, learned uh, the wealth uh, of the other civilizations, and from literature to other elements. Therefore, I can reassure you, and you know that, that I will put all possible efforts. But let me be a bit critical. Uh, not in the case your studies and then India civilization and the legacy is great. I have been prompting my friends from Arab countries for almost 10, 15 years since my time in Malta to bring Ibn Khaldun, to bring Mukatima to the discussions, to use uh, Diplo to, to, to enrich the global civilization, which is very important at this time when many Arab countries are in complex situation, it's important to know that there were such a great thinkers who were uh, social thinkers even before, let's say, Machiavelli. And you mentioned one of the first sociologists. I'm also pushing and trying to encourage my colleagues from Africa. Let's bring it. Let's move it with some, some, uh, some input in impacts. And uh, you mentioned a few colleagues from, let's say, Western countries, but fortunately, uh, although they originate from the UK or other, there are people who are very keen to have this uh, uh, inclusive and uh, uh, let's say, comprehensive discussion. Now, it could stay as a line in the speech, but what we will do, we will make an effort to convert it into the, into the reality, into the inputs, and when we speak about empathy, when we speak about compromise, when we speak about rituals, we will consult Confucius. Obviously, he invested heavily into a question of rituals and procedures. African civilization, when it comes to the community, keeping community dynamics. Therefore, these inputs are very important. And I can tell you, uh, this is one of the, my small life projects. We have to do it. Otherwise, our civilization will walk on one leg and we are not going to walk very far. Therefore, Kishan, all of your points are well taken and we will we'll really move in that spirit. If you find at any point distortion, uh, alert me and be as persuasive as you are uh, always. And thank you for these comments. John, over to you. John Hamery. Uh, Jovan, first of all, thank you so much for organizing this discussion. Uh, and thank you, Kishan, for your remarks. I speak as a representative of a dubious culture. Um, what I'm interested particularly uh, in, Jovan, is whether Amongst the 71 participants in this seminar, there are anybody from African universities or African governments who could help us uh, understand where to look for current scholarship uh, on uh, the African story uh, that you've been relating. Uh, it's a blank spot for us, for most of us, uh, and particularly those of us who either have worked in Africa or are interested in understanding better uh, the current thinking uh, amongst especially the younger generation in Africa about their own history and their contribution to the evolution of diplomacy. You and I both have experience of immensely able uh, African diplomats in New York uh, and in others of the international organizations, uh, but they tend to be uh, bright stars uh, rather than uh, representatives of a, of a totality. Uh, so our, my interest is in the emergence of that totality. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, yes, that will be that will be a difficult uh, uh, uphill task, and not because there is no experience. There is really, really huge experience, but sometimes there is a, some sort of inhibition, and uh, we will try to nudge our colleagues from Africa, in particular, but from developing countries, to feel comfortable to move on to, uh, to not to try to judge their experience in, let's say, negotiation, compromise, in accordance to the parameters set by, uh, let's say, Western scholarly thinking, but to bring that, that authentic uh, way of solving conflicts. All societies have to solve the conflicts. 
Uh, we, I invite uh, colleagues. We had uh, uh, comments from Suila Mazu from uh, from uh, Addis on the on the. I fully agree with the ambassador Russian. For instance, this year we celebrate in North Africa the New Year 2971, which means an advance of nine, 950 years, but not uh, information of, are found about that period. That's great, and I invite colleagues, uh, in particular from uh, from Africa. We have here. I highly recommend Professor Sam Okoto. Of Pondo as a potential contributor. We'll do outreach towards, uh, towards those people. But now the floor is open for, uh, for uh, other comments which could be advised how we, move, how we should move on. We heard from Kishan, we heard from John. Any other suggestion how we should move, move on on this journey? It's always a difficult moment when we, you ask for the question and there are no hands raised. Ah, Asoke, please. Yeah. Yeah. Here is Toki Mukherjee from, uh, from Delhi. Over to you. From Delhi. Thank you, uh, you uh, Johan, for inviting uh, us to this uh, fascinating discussion which you've started. Uh, I am interested, uh, as we go down this journey, in, uh, from perspective of diplomacy, uh, in seeing how uh, the technologies that you have referred to and um, as Rana has referred to, you know, has, it, uh, has the flow of technology always uh, been allowed to flow in an organic evolutionary manner or has diplomacy from time to time tried to stop the flow of technology? Uh, and I ask this question because today we are faced with a similar situation with the new technologies of the fourth industrial revolution where diplomacy suddenly seems to be getting more and more active in, uh, as I call it, weaponizing technology. So that is the reason why I put this point. Thank you. Thank you, Soke, for, for, for this. Is technology enabler or uh, of uh, development or uh, uh, not? Uh, and I will bring one historical figure, very interesting historical figure, which for some reasons is not even celebrated in Russia. He was a Pavel Schilling. Mm -hmm. Pavel Schilling uh, was the uh, envoy of uh, Tsar to Prussia. And he heard of technological developments, and at that time, apparently, diplomats had more time. And then he started experimenting with the electric telegraph. And he moved back to St. Petersburg, and he created the first successful uh, conveying of the electrical signal and basically electrical telegraph. Mm -hmm. And it's not known in diplomacy. And this is another thread which will bring diplomats who uh, basically brought knowledge from uh, Lisbon and Sevilla to the rest of Europe coming from Latin America. A lot of knowledge how to cultivate uh, agriculture. Sometimes uh, from today's perspective, questionable uh, role of, uh, of the diplomats, particularly British and French, when it comes to the archaeological sites in the, in the Middle East and the Crescent, uh, uh, Crescent Arc. Uh, but diplomats have been a conveyor of the, of the knowledge. Uh, I know Kishan and I discussed his early days in San Francisco, where he was uh, sending tele cables back to Delhi saying, hey, something is happening here. And uh, we should put it, uh, and India did very well in San Francisco, I would say. I don't know if it is due to Kishan or, or some other developments. But diplomats have been conveyor of the, of the uh, conveyor belt of scientific progress. Uh, they were also, on when it comes to governance, they were a mix of, uh, of uh, enabler and uh, preserver of status quo. Because diplomacy per se is not a profession that should be ex extremely excited about novelty. It has to keep calmness. It has to keep the emotions under control. And uh, that was the, in a brief, yes, we'll bring these historical figures uh, who, who were diplomats, who, and then we'll also reflect, especially when it come, we come to the last two centuries, what was the role of diplomacy as governance enabler or disabler of technological progress. <clears throat> Thank you, Asoke. We got really great map for the, for the, for the, for the next steps. Petru Dumitriu from uh, Bucharest. Great to see you, Petru. Voice, uh, unmute. Well, Petru, I'll have to use artificial intelligence to read your lips uh, if you don't unmute. That was 
that was uh, now and now you are unmuted now and you, you we should hear you but we don't hear you for some reason uh that you could maybe on the laptop yeah, probably it's a source uh, petru may have a few sources of sound but we'll we'll see maybe arvin will uh, will help petru any other comment, uh, Katarina Hone, uh, director of Diplo's research? Katarina, any idea for new research at Diplo? Mm, a lot, and we've been, we've been discussing them um, quite a bit. I just wanted to bring in another perspective in this discussion on technology and diplomacy, which comes a bit more from a sociolo sociological perspective, I guess. One thing we have to be aware of, I think, is that we typically tell the story of, oh, there's the invention of a new technology, and then everything changes. How we do things, how we relate to each other, is adapting, is changing. And that's true to an extent, and I'm not critical of that perspective, but I think we need to be also aware of another perspective where basically, yes, new technology is emerging, but it's then put in the context of a, of a specific society with specific values, with a specific way of doing things, which then shapes how we actually use the technology. So it's not just that the technology is shaping how we do things. So to give a very uh, low level example, we have Twitter, diplomats start using Twitter and it changes a bit of interaction and it gives a kind of new dimension to it. At the same time, we can also say we already have a specific system of diplomacy into which Twitter emerges. That means Twitter is then used in a certain way. And that's, I think, is a very crucial other perspective. And I think it, we can illustrate it really nicely in these recent debates about trust. So there are a lot of debates about a lack of trust that is really driven by social media. And if, if we look at cybersecurity initiatives, they always mention we need to rebuild trust or public diplomacy initiatives. We need to rebuild trust. And then one narrative is to say social media erodes trust because we have fake news. We have all this potential for manipulation. But we can also turn it around and look at it in another way. We already had a certain lack of trust, this kind of erosion of um, um, of public trust, of the public space, into which then comes social media, which exacerbates the whole thing, but doesn't in the first place create it. So I think that that's perhaps quite a useful perspective to also keep in mind. But, uh, while we're waiting for Petrus and others to join, uh, Katarina, just one comment, which is very important. We always think about science and technology as artifacts, but they are basically ideas. And behind most of the breakthroughs, you have idea context and you have developments which are, which are uh, part of the particular context. We can move with the Silicon Valley as the latest developments. It is not surprising that things have developed there because of the developments of the last few decades. And I can see that in audience we have uh, uh, um, um, Thomas Il uh, Ilves. I won't call you to intervene, Thomas, but I know that uh, a former president of uh, Estonia, gr one of the person behind Estonia's uh, great digital success, and also, if I'm correct, based uh, partially in Silicon Valley. That would, would be interesting also to have that, that, uh, that uh, connection uh, coming from, uh, from, uh, from Silicon, uh, Silicon, uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, we, therefore, the point from, uh, from uh, Katerina, context, social context and social dynamics that we have uh, to follow in order to understand the uh, uh, developments uh, around. Any other input uh, or comment uh, from uh, from excellent uh, gathering uh, here? And I don't know if um, uh, just connect uh, or uh, raise your hand. We are very informal in this uh, this gathering. I hope Petru fix his problem uh, with the technology and all other great uh, great thinkers in uh, in the room and the pract practitioners of diplomacy and academicians. Okay, we have from Sohila Amazu, uh, is diplomacy helping to advance and facilitate adoption of technology by population of it, or it is opposite, it, it is uh, uh, technology that serves diplomacy. Yes, that's basically this, uh, this dynamics and I just heard that that's, that's one of the key, key issue of this dynamics. Is it first technology, then diplomacy or diplomacy technology? We just hear from Thomas that he's back in Est uh, Estonia. Please uh, share with us a few reflections if you feel comfortable 
I know that uh, your experience and expertise and uh, also political experience could be very useful. Uh, yep, Thomas, we have, uh, we have also, how is the situation with Petro Dimitriou? Bad, bad, bad. No. Okay, Petru, you can try. Unmute now. Okay, it's still a red, uh, red microphone, I can see. Now try. No, it seems that problem is beyond this binary dilemma, red microphone versus, versus, uh, versus white, that the problem is, is a bit uh, deeper. We are coming close to the end of the session. I would like now to summarize about the next steps, what we are going to do. Obviously, please come with your comments and suggestions. Uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you have it, your comments, uh, uh, have been very, very useful for shaping our discussion. What are going to be the next steps? We are going to uh, organize for each session. The next session in February will be on prehistory. We'll try to dig out from uh, anthropological and archaeological studies major inputs uh, from the prehistory and these early traces of diplomacy. We'll have also some simulated uh, discussion uh, with our far, far predecessors who can be from uh, Cro-Magnon or Neanderthal. We'll find who is, the, who is the free for us to join uh, for that, uh, that discussion. And we will, we will uh, then, uh, in all processes, uh, you will see, we'll consulting the literature that exists currently in this field. One of the major problems is that there is very little literature and it is somehow surprising, uh, except, let's say, from Vienna con uh, Congress onwards. Bit on the Renaissance diplomacy, on Italian Renaissance diplomacy, but this is more or less, more or less uh, all. Uh, in that journey, uh, that will be, we'll go into monthly discussion, but throughout the month, we will set up the space uh, where you can contribute with your comments, suggestions, in particular comments and suggestions that Kishan and John highlighted from other regions, and Asoki and others uh, on the question of the role of uh, diplomacy. In this process, we will be publishing at the end of the month uh, uh, summary, summary papers that we hope can enrich academic discussion. And we'll be also in, informing political and diplomatic community Probably you know how it is the attention span, the bandwidth for the policymakers is limited, but we'll try to package it in the way that they spend three to five minutes, maybe through animated discussion with uh, Churchill or somebody else, to think about, about these developments which are, uh, just not to cut the, the press pause on the screen or the close the, close the screen. That will be challenging task, but we'll try to also send this message towards uh, policy policymakers. Uh, we have uh, also, uh, we'll have a small quiz for those of you who would like to get a certificate. I know that it's not motivation of the most of you. There will be short of a short quiz and at the end uh, we'll have a, some sort of um, uh, um, end of the course and the certificate and whatever comes with uh, this learning, uh, learning journey. Here were a few uh, comments from uh, uh, Joao Carlos Caribe. On my research, I found the way AI are affecting the truth and perception of reality. How far you evaluate this could affect diplomacy at all? Uh, Joao, yes, we'll discuss the current era, but we do it also in other DIPLOS projects. But our main focus will be on the, let's say, on truth and perception in historical perspective. And that will be that will be important task and will come towards the end of our journey to the current era. But it is covered in other diplos activities, AI and the other activities. Zorica Povrenovic, we are perhaps witnessing the transition to virtual diplomacy, which will be characterized primarily by speed of decision making, security of diplomats, and reducing the cost of diplomatic mission. But as always, time will show the advantage and disadvantages of such diplomacy and how sustainable it is which will require the development of new diplomatic skills, ways of thinking and acting. 
Now, one message that we can learn from Lord Palmerston, uh, those of you who follow my presentation know that I always quote it. When he received the first telegram after the Paris talks, after the Crimea War, mid 19th century, he said, this is the end of diplomacy. Because he thought, now we can communicate. I don't have to wait for my ambassador to come from Paris. I can send them telegraph. Well, as we know, diplomacy survived. And my argument, and I will strongly argue uh, for it, that diplomacy has a bright future. Because we live in an interdependent world. We need more uh, compromise. We need more negotiations. We need more engagement because that interdependence cannot be easily solved by military force. And this is opposition between diplomacy and, uh, and military. It can, but the cost is very high for society. Now, well, that would be one argument that diplomacy won't not only survive, but it will have bright future. By whom it will be performed, this is another question. And I am doubtful that traditional diplomacy will remain in the way it is today, but we can discuss it. Atev Ahmed, I think cybersecurity is a new domain of international relations, it's highly increasing, and many countries consider this new phenomenon is a big threat to the country's sovereignty. I mean the traditional concept of sovereignty. Yes. Uh, Atev, the question of the history of sovereignty, Westphalia, and other developments, and we will uh, we'll reflect uh, on that as one of trajectory throughout the history. John, uh, then uh, Mark Carvel, it's great to have Mark Carvel, a uh, 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 great uh, uh, British digital diplomat, uh, now retired, having more time to share with us. Uh, Mark's question is quite simple. Is conflict between states more likely in digital age if technology allows political leaders to bypass diplomatic pro processes that might prevent conflict? The answer may be complex, however, Will this be discussed? As always, a simple question with so many layers. A, what is the importance of the traditional rituals? Is Twitter diplomacy helping a compromise and understanding or not? What we have to keep from traditional diplomacy in order to counterbalance this immediacy? Diplomacy, we shouldn't forget it, is a profession of not too fast reaction. And this is with the reason. When you walk to the UN in, uh, in Geneva, especially in Geneva, people always told me everything is so calm. And I always I said, quiet. I said, this is done on purpose because you shouldn't have too much excitement. These people have to calmly discuss, sometimes too calmly, I would say, uh, security problems. Therefore, Mark, it is a very interesting point. And we will, yes, reflect on that throughout the history and see what we can learn from history. Uh, Pelin Musabi Baki, could we also focus on the role of digitalization in conduct of public diplomacy in our journey uh, during this session? Yes, Pelin, but let me just make an important caveat. This series won't be on the digital diplomacy. It will be on technology and diplomacy. We'll be making the historical parallels, but not going in depth on Twitter diplomacy, Facebook diplomacy, and other things. This is the framing. We have other diplo activities like digital foreign policy, Katarina is leading it, where we can do more on that. Kishan, a good point made by Mark, but I remain optimistic on the question Mark asks. Good, that's important question that will I'm sure discuss quite a bit uh, uh, in the uh, coming period. From YouTube, uh, Nadviga and Nigeru, we have seen in the recent past some social media giants censor content on social media accounts of foreign governments. How is diplomacy going to be affected by such development and how can the issue be addressed to avoid conflict on misuse? Yes. Uh, we had just a session at the uh, Geneva Press Club on the question, uh, was it a good decision to cancel S uh, Trump from social media? And it was a very, very interesting debate. I suggest that you, you consult it. And a very heated debate. And I can tell you on this point, uh, my friendship with uh, quite a few friends from, uh, from the United States uh, my friendship has been tested, we survived, uh, but uh, this is the one of the crucial uh, questions. To what extent 
uh, social media can cancel people from the net. We're not speaking about emergency, which, was, which happened in the Washington DC, but the question of canceling individuals, countries, diplomats, current former head of state. And that power is enormous power. And I think diplomats will have to deal it. Let me be very practical and concrete. If Zoom decides to cut our session today, I'm based in Geneva. I don't have a place where to go and to complain. They won't do it. Trust me, they're a solid uh, platform. But governments cannot deliver on their basic social contract to protect security of their people online, to protect their market access, to protect their access and visibility on Facebook and other things. As you know, Australia is now uh, introducing new law which basically should share income companies, social media companies should share income with the local press. The lady who represented uh, uh, Google in this discussion said, okay, if we are not happy with this law, we'll cut access to people from Australia. And the Australian prime minister in very Australian way said, no, 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 we are not going to be threatened. Therefore, this debate is going to be major on very simple issue. Can governments deliver on social contract with their citizens? Whom to call in old Kissinger, whom to call when I want to call Europe? Whom to call when Swiss authorities or police needs to protect my rights or uh, Ashoka's rights in India or John's right in UK? Do we just depend on the goodwill of the companies? or we have some sort of mechanism. This is going to be one big issue for the for diplomatic services to negotiate. I advise, and uh, Katerina can share the, our text on digital foreign policy, where countries are developing their digital foreign policy. Uh, Switzerland has a strategy, France, India is developing internal structure, essentially to see how to deliver on this basic social contract to their citizens. I'm optimistic for one reason. Companies are realizing that if they want to make sustainable future, they have to be part of this contract. They have to give up on some of their enormous might. And uh, there, is, there are some signs of optimism, but governments and diplomatic services need to step up their capacity to negotiate around these issues. On cybersecurity, you mentioned on human rights, on democracy, on e-commerce, on identity, data flows. And this is basically the grand, grand bargain that we'll have uh, in time ahead of us. Obviously, COVID crisis accelerated that, and uh, we are seeing this. Therefore, we brought this historical journey or this introductory session to our current time, and this is great. We are going to be reflecting and making it relevant for our time with all caveats be careful with historical analogies but that will be that will be definitely important part that we anchor it in the into these developments then we have a uh, liga air trade and business have always played a key role in diplomacy agree it has the important size cyber space change anything is private digital uh, sector yes we'll discuss it Digital Field Marshal Rahman, how cybersecurity related crime which go cross border could be helpful from digital diplomacy. This is a big issue, how to deal cross border crime. Uh, Maricela Munoz, great series. Uh, it will be great to explore diplomats as agents of change in this journey. And in the context, how could diplomats help promote a more inclusive, just new social contract? Thank you, Maricela. We expect more inputs from Latin America, from you, from Dahlia, for friends uh, from Latin America. Please uh, bring the rich Latin American tradition uh, to in this discussion. Kishan already mentioned it. Uh, Katerina sent a few links from the Facebook. Uh, Surenda Pokhrel, do you think digital diplomacy as persuasive as in personal diplomacy? Can small nations survive digital diplomacy? Digital diplomacy understood as a tool for conducting diplomacy is as persuasive it can be. I still believe that person-to-person -person contacts are more important. 
But we have to make distinction between digital as a tool for diplomats, and here we have Twitter, Facebook, and other diplomacy or use of data in diplomacy, and digital as a topic that diplomats address. Privacy protection, cybersecurity, and other issues. Dalia, we have many comments here in the Embassy of Mexico. Great, we are looking forward to hearing. Uh, I got from Rahman from Bangladesh National Cybersecurity Crime Div Division. Great, I'm really excited at the beginning of this journey, uh, especially with excellent comments coming from uh, from the our colleagues from Latin America, Africa, Asia. Uh, for me, it is uh, it is uh, uh, the main project, personal project that uh, I will lead uh, this year. As you know, we are very busy at Diplo with artificial intelligence, digital diplomacy courses, but this project can uh, give us uh, excellent uh, reflections about, in the Kissinger way of thinking, about our current moment and about our future. And that will be uh, great excitement and great challenge ahead of us. Thank you for joining us today. Stay tuned, stay, sa stay safe, and uh, wait for more uh, inputs uh, from uh, our side. Have a nice evening for Asoke, Kishan, and colleagues in India. Have a nice day and morning for our friends from Latin America. Well, and it's getting dark here in Geneva because, uh, because it's cloudy. And uh, um, see you soon. All the best. Bye-bye.